sharks. I can guarantee that one of two emotions just went through your head. The majority of this room, and I can tell by your faces, thinks fear. Largely, as we all know, because of the movie Jaws, but also because of the general dramatization of anything to do with sharks in the media. The odd one of you might have thought fascination. Likely because you've read, watched, or heard scientific facts about what sharks really are. Now, each of these emotions is driven by the perception you have of this animal. This perception has been created by the information you have received. To have an accurate perception of something, factual information is required. This is the role of public communication of science. And I've spent about the last five years trying to figure out the best way to communicate to people science in order to change their perceptions on sharks. The problem is these days, the average person rarely picks up a scientific article. In fact, a recent study estimated that 1.8 million scientific articles are published every year. 50% of them are read only by the author and the editor, <laughs> and 90% of them are never cited and shared. It's a little sad, yeah, I know. The problem with that is that nowadays, people gather information from social media, from television, and from the internet. And the problem with this is information in these is not peer-reviewed nor scientifically proven. And what's worse is you all think it is. Just look at Shark Week, for example. It recently shifted from highly educational science-based documentaries to the total dramatization of these creatures. Last year and again this year, they actually went past dramatization, actually lying and misleading to the public that things like Megalodon and extinct 60-foot great white still exist these days. It's evident that science is lacking presence in modern media. It's not that it's not out there or not that you guys don't want to hear it. It's the fact that we're not communicating it through the forums you guys most often use. So how can we improve this uptake? How can we improve the public communication of science? Well, I believe by making it appealing and digestible. I believe that stimulating visual imagery is a good tool in doing this. Now, such imagery already exists for sharks. And to be honest, it's largely responsible for the pseudoscience that has led to their general dislike. This image, for example, the average person doesn't register that a piece of bait has just been pulled away from this animal, and that's why its jaws are blaring and it's going on the cage. Most people, and you probably right now, just think, holy crap, that thing is literally trying to get inside the cage and eat me. But what about when we replace such images of pseudoscience with ones of contextual fact? This is probably one of the most famous forms of such imagery when it comes to sharks. It's from my good friend Ocean Ramsey. And even with this image, you may be thinking, wow, she's crazy, she's gonna get eaten, maybe not now, but eventually because it's a shark. Pseudoscience. The contextual fact you're actually picking up and looking at this is no. Great whites don't just eat people willy-nilly because there's a person right there, alive, coexisting with one. Now, add to this thought some scientific text, or better, use, or better yet, use what is the video of this and add scientific narration. And quickly, contextual fact can be spread like wildfire using stimulating visual imagery in modern media. The video of this, for example, hit 2.5 million people in two days. It's sad to say, but a scientific article I ever wrote will never reach that many people that quickly. And it's because information in, within these is appealing because it captures your attention in seconds. And if laced with science, it can change your understanding. And then your perceptions can change. Now this is a very necessary step in shark conservation. As Senegalese environmentalist Baba Diom famously once said, in the end, we will only protect what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we're taught. Such progression couldn't be more necessary than for the demonized shark. Because 20 years ago, China's affluence boomed with free trade and open markets, increasing GDP exponentially. Shark fin soup, a dish eaten by only the very upper class, became commonplace amongst the masses of new millionaires. And with it, the global demand for shark fins. Now, sharks live offshore and out of sight, 
So not only do we not like them very much, but we don't see them all that often. And because of this, a barbaric trade known as shark finning has been allowed to run rampant for the last 20 years. It's resulted in the decimation of shark populations globally by over 90%. Now, to visualize the degree of this decimation, you need to realize that sharks have existed on this earth for over 400 million years. Now, think of that time as the distance from the earth to the moon. The 20 years in which we have nearly wiped these guys off the face of the earth is the equivalent to 20 meters in comparison to that distance. Fear, dislike, blindness, this is not justification for our actions. New Zealand contributed to this decimation. For 20 years, we finned up to 80,000 blue sharks every single year in our waters. For those of you who don't know what that means, it's 80,000 of these cool little dudes being pulled onto a boat, all its fins sliced off, and its limp body kicked back over the side. And for what? A bowl of soup. New Zealand was actually one of the top 10 exporters in the world partaking in this barbaric trade. There was cash data to show it, and science from around the world proving it adverse to the ocean ecosystem. So the big question is, why the hell was 100% pure New Zealand a leader in this trade? Simple answer, it's because you guys didn't know about it. This was a textbook example of a lack of public communication of science. And upon realizing that this was a major issue in New Zealand, I made it central to my PhD. Doing a literature review, I obtained the scientific facts, but I then needed to share it with the New Zealand public. But how? Well, conventionally, I would sit at my desk for one to three years in an office, formulating ideas, getting conclusions, eventually getting publications that, as we've heard, only myself and an editor may ever read. So it was obvious this was going to take too long, it was going to be too slow, and it was not going to reach enough people. So instead, what I decided to do was take the science from around the world, the catch data in New Zealand, put the two together and publicly communicate it to New Zealanders using stimulating visual imagery and media. My number one tool for doing this was free diving with sharks. It's what originally turned my fear into fascination and allowed me to understand how important these animals are, and I hoped it would do the same for yours. By drawing in public appeal with imagery, I was then allowed a few minutes to explain why. Shark Science Reasoning 101, if you take out an apex predator in any ecosystem, you cause a domino or trophic cascade effect down the food chain. In New Zealand, we earn $1.65 billion from the marine food chain. We earn $5 million from fitting 80,000 sharks. Taking out that many apex predators puts the entire thing at risk. It did not make sense. But by sharing this information with New Zealanders, you became aware of it. And very quickly, public opinion gathered. Children began asking questions. Parents signed petitions and submissions. And very quickly, the more scientific information obtained, the more scientifically backed opinions were created. But very quickly, I all of a sudden found myself in this growing snowball, doing something that science had taught me not to do, and that was to communicate through the media. Science has had a bit of a vendetta with media for two major reasons. Emotional bias by the communicator, and media manipulation of data and facts. Now, I saw this as far simpler, to be honest. I had a piece of paper from the government with numbers on it. I read it in front of a TV screen to you on the other side. Simple as that. Nonetheless, I was in this constant paradox between conventional communication and media communication. And what's worse is my scientific community started warning me of the apparent fine line I was treading between being a scientist and an activist. As you can probably tell by the tone of my voice, it was kind of stressing me out a little bit, and um, I, I had to escape. So, I, and more importantly, I had to look for some justification to use media as a form of communication. And ironically, I didn't land very far from such controversy, ending up in Western Australia to document a shark cull. Now, over there, 
Seven people in three years were killed by great whites, and a government in a knee-jerk reaction to having done nothing preventative implemented a drumline policy to catch and kill sharks over three meters in length, which they for some reason termed to be imminent threats to water users. Now, they justified this plan by saying it was 100% backed by science. But upon getting there, this literally couldn't have been further from the truth. What I witnessed there was not only unscientific, but it was abhorrent, and it was an extremely sad example of politics ruling supreme over science. I was there alongside my colleague Ocean Ramsey once again, and, and we formulated a plan to communicate to the public the actual science behind the cull. And we were going to use the power of media to do this. So upon witnessing several undersized sharks being released alive, yet sinking to the bottom and dying of exhaustion after 12 hours on a hook, we jumped in, we grabbed one of these imminent threats from the bottom, and heaved it to the surface and swam it for an hour and a half to resuscitate it. It swam off alive, having been left for dead. And in doing so, vision went up to thousands on YouTube. News helicopters streamed live footage to media channels across the world, and the many interviews that followed because of the imagery allowed us to share the actual science behind, it, behind the cull, and that was that science does not support it. The communication of this science happened overnight and it happened worldwide. And in doing so, people who had been pro cull because of fear and political information obtained real facts and often changed their mind on the cull. The positive movement I saw from this one event cemented in me that at times, stimulating visual imagery in modern media can communicate science better than I can from my desk. This was the justification I was looking for. And upon returning back to New Zealand, I saw more of it. Because public pressure had resulted in the government declaring a shark fin ban was gonna happen. But blue sharks, the number one shark being finned, were gonna be left out for three more years until 2016. So I'm at my desk in my office, ironically drafting the second chapter of my PhD about how sharks are extremely vulnerable to overexploitation. And all I could think about was what if? What if blue sharks in New Zealand are at the tipping point? What if three more years of finning puts them into an irreversible decline that's gonna adversely affect their population and let alone the surrounding ecosystem? It was right then and there, at that point, that I realized that conventional science, pen to paper, at my office, in my, on my desk, was not going to inspire the necessary change needed to help these guys. So once again, I called up my friend Ocean and requested some international pressure on the issue. As she flew over, I called all the forms of media I could think of, and I once again went back to my toolbox of freediving with sharks. Only this time, Ocean and I were going to step it up a little by taking the reporters themselves into the water with us. Now, by increasing the public appeal, I was then able to share more science with more people. The bottom line being, three more years of finning was unjustified, and New Zealanders have already made it very clear they want it gone now. Simultaneous to this, members of the New Zealand Shark Alliance were doing the same. In government meetings, in NGO forums, picketing on street corners and in our children's schools, cutting out cardboard fins with messages on them, all to the government to ban finning. After two years of persistence, over 78,000 public petitions and submissions were sent to the government with that message. To give you an idea of what this meant for a change in perception of sharks, 70,000 people submitted for the protection of Maui's dolphin. New Zealanders like sharks just as much as the smallest, most endangered dolphin on Earth. For sharks, that was progress. And in the end, that progress was worth it. 
Because as of October this year, 2014, finning of these beautiful creatures will be banned in New Zealand. Yeah, good stuff. Oh. In the end, a result was achieved because people were given scientific information. Stimulating visual imagery assisted in spreading this. With this result seemingly under the belt, I can't help but think about those tiger sharks back in Western Australia, labelled as imminent threats to us. Can this perception be changed in order to help protect them? Well, I can ask all you guys now, I think, through stimulating visual imagery like this, should you think of these animals with fear or fascination? Thank you.